Hey, Vav, Ahmed Bey's 86B. I don't know if you got to watch the video yesterday, uh, the video of yesterday's year. But yesterday was a very fascinating Gemara about the transformative power of Teshuva and its capacity to transform the past. Till, till then, we were talking about Shiva as a, as a leaving go of the past and moving forward. But then yesterday, we discussed at such a level of Shiva where a person incorporates his past in his Shiva and thus incorporates his past in transformation. And very short, very brief, we watched the class from yesterday, more elaboration. But essentially, a person does the Shiva with a love where love, as we defined it, is a, des- a desire to want to get closer. And the farther a person feels, the more a person wants to get closer. So when a person understands that the sin he did caused distance between him and Hashem, then that itself fuels his passionate love. I want to get closer, like a kid who's in camp who feels the love for their parents more than when he's sitting at home because he misses them. So when we feel like we're distant from Hashem as a result of sin, the passion we have to return to Hashem gets even deeper. So in that sense, the past mistake is fuel for my teshuva. This is fueling my passion to go forward. So it's a transformative element of the past as well. That's where we left off yesterday. And if you didn't yet see it, I encourage you to watch yesterday's shir to get more, that more in depth. And um, you'll see there I linked to another video where I did this same Gemara in five different levels of explaining it. Simple level, Drush level, Kabbalah level, Hasidus level. So I encourage you to look at that as well. Okay. Um, we are, if you count up from the narrow set of lines, we're one, two, three, four, five. The line begins with the word me'ava, and the middle line says, Oma Rabbi Shmuel Bar Do you want to have a copy? Yeah, sure. Oma Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmoni. Rabbi Shmuel Sanu Nachmoni said, Oma Rabbi Yechanan, Oma Rabbi Yechanan, Oma Rabbi Yechanan. Gedoyla Teshuvah, great is Teshuvah. Shema Reches, it lengthens. Shnaisav shal Adam, the years of man. Brings long life. Shnema as the verse reads, Vashoiv Resha Mirishasai, and the wicked one shall return from his wicked ways. Chayur Yichya, he shall live, is to say, Teshuvah itself brings length of days, long life. So, obviously, as we've been talking about till now, there's one way of looking at reward is compensation. Hashem was patting you on the back, you did so well, the Teshuvah case, I'll give you a couple of years. But the way we've been looking at, this, at reward on a deeper level is as consequence, the natural result of whatever it is you're doing, that's its reward. It's a, not, not, I don't want to say natural consequence, but it's like a, it's the resulting phenomenon of what you've done. And of course, the essence of life, not the essence of life, literal life comes from Hashem. And therefore attachment to Hashem just means deeper life or more real life. So if we were such pure people, this would happen literally to us. As we did mitzvahs and everything what God wants, we would have literally longer life. But even if it doesn't work out literally for us, because of whatever other calculation Hashem has, or whatever other things we're doing that may not make it work it out, or for whatever reasons, the life itself is lengthened. You know, Marecha Shneisav, it lengthens his years. It means every year itself is more lengthened. It's more full. It's, it's more... It's filled with more of real life, the essence of life. If life is connection to Hashem, then every moment to live with the connection to Hashem, then that moment of life itself is lengthened. Not because of the minute any longer. The minute is a minute, but it's longer because it's more full, it's more packed with Hashem's truth. This is the famous story which illustrates the point. It's a famous chassid of the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe. And I don't remember the exact context of the story, but the bottom line was, I don't remember how he got to this point in the story, but the, at this point in the story, the Alter offers to bless him with long life. There was something that happened that led him to the point where the Alter offered him that blessing. And um, he was, his name was Bikisil Lepler, and he was uh, hesitant. And he explained to the Alter the reason why he's hesitant is because he's happy to take length of days, but it shouldn't be peasant years. Meaning, 
I want length of days. I'm happy to have a long life, but not if it's going to be void of any content of anything real, anything real in life. It'll take long years, but long years of doing nothing? What's, what do I need that for? It should be long years, but filled with long. They should be long years in their content, not just in their, you know, days on the calendar. Yeah, not just the quality, quantity of days in the calendar, but quality length of days. And that's... Yeah, but even if he's living life, but if his life is about waiting till he gets to the next meal, then he's not interested. He wants life. It's filled with the content of Hashem's true essence and truth. And that's what, another way of reading this verse is that it lengthens the person's days, first on a literal level, if we so merit, but on a conceptual level. And our years are now filled with Hashem's truth, considering our teshuva. The end was, this chassid lived past 100 years old, and he saw the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, the second, Mitle Rebbe, Tzimach Tzedek, and the Marash. He saw four Chabad Rebbes, which is a very unusual thing. A person lives that long. All kinds of interesting stories about him. Okay. The Gemara continues. Amr Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak said, Amr Marava, they would say in the West. The West, of course, is Eretz Yisrael, because we are here in the Gemara. We are in Babylonia somewhere in modern uh, Iran or Iraq, somewhere there. So they would refer to Eretz Yisrael as the West. Right? We face East when we dive and they would face West. So Rabbi Yitzchak said that in the West, they would say, Mari. they would say there in the name of the scholar Rabbah, son of Mari. And they would say as follows, come and observe. The measure or the mannerism of Hashem is not like the measure and the mannerism of a human being. How so? The measure of a human being is a person may offend his friend using words. You say something offensive to a friend. So Suffolk it's a doubt whether you're not this person is capable of being appeased. Perhaps he may not be appeased from the offense that this person has given to his fellow. Now, even if this guy is the kind of person who will get appeased, he will be, he is a forgiving person. But it's doubtful whether or not words alone will elicit a appeasement from your friend. Perhaps he won't be appeased by words and you'll need to buy him a gift or something. So you never know with a person. Maybe he's the kind of guy who's just never going to never going to forgive. Just, just doesn't let go. And if he, even if he does let go, who said you can just talk about it. You might have to do more than just talk about it. So this is true of the way people are. I'm a college baruch about God. Adam over Aveda, person transgresses. The says are concealed. So there's already a distinction. Before, he's talking about offensive words to his friend, meaning he spoke to his friend directly and offended him right to his face. And um, in that case, he may not forgive. And even if he forgives, he may not... Um, one second. Good morning, Judge. So he may, he may not forgive. Um, and even if he forgives, he may not forgive just by talking about it, but you might have to do more than just um, speaking to him. And that's if you've talked, you've offended him face to face. But when it comes to Hashem, your offense to him could be concealed, meaning you're doing it secretly. And uh, in that case, just in the simple reading of the Gemara, I'll get into maybe a deeper reading in a moment, but in the simple reading of the Gemara, it, it seems that the Gemara tried to indicate that it's a worse kind of offense because um, you're talking behind his back. So, First of all, with God, he, first of all, God's willing to forgive and words are enough to get Hashem's forgiveness, an apology and an acknowledgement of what you've done. And this is the way in which Hashem is different than man, which man you may not be successful in appeasing. And even if you are, words might not be enough. But when it comes to Hashem, even if you sin behind his back, as it were, or at least from your perception, from your perception it's behind his back, Nonetheless, words alone are enough to appease Hashem, as it were. Shnei Mar, the verse reads, The Prophet says, Take with you words. 
take words with you. Veshuvu al Hashem, return to God. So words itself are enough for return. And the verse goes on to say and acknowledge what you've done. Not only is words enough to gain appeasement from Hashem, God, as it were, takes it as a favor you've done for him. When you did the Shuvah, you did the Hashem considers it as if you did him, did him a favor. It's pretty incredible. Think about that. Hashem sees it as a favor. We'll explain that in a minute. Shinemar's the verse reads, the same verse says, uh, the verse says, take words, return unto God, the one who will bear its sin, and the one who will take good, as in he'll take your favor. But not only that, not only does God take it as a favor to give him to Shuvah, but the verse considers it, as if you have offered offering the temple. Shinemar is the verse, the same very verse continues, our lips shall pay off the cows. As if to say, all the offerings are supposed to bring an offering by us speaking, by saying words of prayer, that's considered by God as if we've done the offerings in the temple. So Hashem HaTayim, perhaps you might say, maybe it's relegated to uh, God considers your words, your prayer, as if it was a animal, an offering you're required to bring, which God's very happy with, with someone who fulfills their obligation to bring a offering. But it's not as great as someone who brings it willingly. A gift. So Tamil Lema, the verse comes and says, I heal your I heal you when you return to me. I love your gift. That is to say, Hashem considers your words of Teshuva as if they are a free gift, not just an obligation. So let's do a little deeper dive. So the simple reading is the Gemara is just saying that Hashem accepts appeasement. Not only that, he takes it as if it's a favor, almost like he doesn't expect you to do Teshuva. And you do it, he's wow, he's so gracious, he's so like happy and pleased and like you did him a favor, as it were. And not only that, it's as if you've served him in the temple in the highest form, willfully going to Hashem and offering a carbon. So perhaps let's do, understand this as follows. And let's go back to the first statement that said about a person doing sin concealed. So we said that the reason why concealed is worse than in the person's face is because when you do conceal, it's if you're doing behind their back. But deeper still, we might say, suggest as follows. The very fact that you thought you were concealed from me is the biggest offense. A person uh, does a sin and he tells Hashem, look, I know this is a problem. Just look, I'm a human being and I, and I, I faulted, I made a mistake. That's one thing. The other, but then when a person says, oh, I'm hiding from you, Hashem, and I'm doing a sin because I don't want you to see, that's even greater offense. Don't you know I'm watching everything? It's an even greater offense. Not, not that, no, it's not that the sin itself is hidden. It's the fact that you thought you were hidden makes it even more offensive. Don't you know that I'm watching? And that too, Hashem, with words alone, Hashem is happy to accept. In other words, all, all a person needs to do Teshuvah is to acknowledge to Hashem, A, that it was wrong, and B, to acknowledge to Hashem and say, you're right, you were there the whole time. You're right, you were there the whole time. And that's why when a person acknowledges Tashem that I knew you were there the whole time. That's why it's a favor to Hashem. Because the truth is Hashem was there the whole time. And because Hashem was there, what did my sin do? We talked about this before. My sin doesn't just drag me down to a negative place, but it drags the divine energy invested in me to a negative place. So when I do Teshuvah and I redeem that moment, then the divine energy that I drag down to the negative place also gets restored back to where it's supposed to be. So I've done as it were, quote unquote, God a favor. The Teshuvah is not just for me, but it's for Hashem. I thought you weren't there, and that's why I did the sin, but by acknowledging and recognizing that you were there, and I dragged you down there, you Hashem. And when I did the shuv, I'm, I'm taking you out of that negative place. So, so Hashem says it's a favor to me, because my energy was invested in the negative place, and now you've redeemed that. So it's a favor unto me. And not only that, it's a karbon. And a karbon, as a... Uh, we know in, in Hasidus, from Hasidus, what a carbon does is it elevates with it all the animals of the world. That's the idea of a carbon. In Kabbalah, the idea of bringing the sac animal sacrifices, that when this animal is elevated on Tashem, it's a representation of all animals of the world, and all of them are elevated to Hashem. And that's what the base of English is. Uh, the animal elevates the animal kingdom, the flower, the flower, like the, the cake, elevates all the 
crops in the world and the, the wine elevates the liquids in the world and the very stones in the basement elevate all of the minerals, all the physical parts of the world. And the human being who comes to bring the offering is what elevates humanity. So Hashem is saying with the, car, with the doing teshuva, it's not just you, you did yourself a favor by taking yourself out of your negative place. Not only did me a favor by taking my divine energy out of the place, but you've done a favor to the whole universe. And we talked about before, when a person restores his relationship with Hashem and restores the divine energy to where it's supposed to be, now it's under, it justifies why God created everything. The whole world is created for this person to do teshuva. So when a person does teshuva, the whole world now has justification. So all of Hashem's investment and all of creation is now redeemed and worthy because this person did teshuva. And this teshuva is, is best, or it's, it's most, uh, the ultimate goal is, not that Hashem compel you to do teshuva. The whole, point of the, the, the whole point of this project is that Jews, from their place of distance from Hashem, choose to find Hashem. Not they have a prophet or some external factor that prods you and pushes you to come to Hashem. But rather that we do it freely, willingly. So even though in times in the temple they had greater divine revelation, but their service to Hashem was on a lower level to some degree because their connection to Hashem was a reaction to the revelation they were experiencing in the temple or a reaction to the revelation they're getting from the prophets. Whereas today, the prophet is speaking to people who are post-temple, telling them, your lips, your words are, not, are like an offering that's a freely gifted offering because no one's compelling you. You have no divine revelation. You have no temple. You have no, you have no uh, prophets. But here you are just by just acknowledging the truth that Hashem was everywhere with your sin. You're freely recognizing that, freely and truly recognizing that. That's truly the ultimate purpose for why everything was created. So the Jew in this place of distance, choose, choose to serve Hashem. And with that, we'll learn the next line, which will wrap up this discussion. And then tomorrow we'll get to another, another element of Teshuvah. But with what we just said, we'll understand the next Gemara very well. The Gemara says like this, Tanya, we were taught, for one person to tshuva, the entire world is forgiven. Shnevar's the verse reads, I will heal you from when you return. I love your gift. This is the same verse we quoted earlier. But then the verse, this is the part of the verse we haven't quoted yet. Because my anger has been returned from him. It doesn't say my anger is returned from them, as if to say all of them did the shuva. Elamimenu, it says from him, one single guy to the shuva, and the whole world is being healed. Based on what we say, we understand. We just finished saying that with every time a person does teshuva, every time a person does a mitzvah, it has cosmic effect because now the divine energy that Hashem invested in you and that Hashem invested in all of creation has come to its purpose because finally the person did what he's supposed to do. So one person doing teshuva makes the, makes the creation of the entire of the universe worth it. And thus brings healing and redemption and forgiveness to the entirety of the universe. I saw once from Steinzal, so he explains why or he gives an angle as to why Chassid is constantly insists that the Shiva is not just about you and Hashem, but has cosmic uh, truth. And he says, I don't know if this is why Chassid does this. I, mean, I assume Chassid does it because it's the truth. He's just sharing the, what the truth of the matter is. But Steinsaltz adds an element which gives us a little inspiration when we do the Shiva, when we think about it as a cosmic issue. Namely, he says, imagine, you know, we all experience this. You're driving a car alone. You have one level of safety measures you take. When you're driving in the car with your wife and kids, now all of a sudden you're driving more cautiously. So what happened? You don't value your own life? Like you were driving yesterday more recklessly. So either way, either you trust your reckless driving and do it with your wife and kids, who cares? Or you, you don't trust your reckless driving, then, then why are you driving reckless when you're alone? You don't care about your own life? Like what, what, what's the story? But the, the, but the reality is we all experience this. Why is that? Because when it comes to ourselves, we say, okay, look, if it's just about me not being perfect, okay, I can handle it. But I can't take responsibility of, the, of somebody else uh, suffering or somebody else or something else, something, something else in the world going wrong. Me, I'll do it with the consequences myself. I, I won't have to have the best reward in the, world, in, in the world, in the afterlife, okay. But to mess it up for somebody else, that I can't take responsibility for. And that's what we can think about when we understand that the show has a, has cosmic effect. It's not just a question of you, your relationship with Hashem. Okay, so I won't be so religious. I won't have the best relationship with Hashem. Hashem is saying, what are, your relationship with me? That's only part of the picture. What about, what, what about my purpose? What about the reason for the entire creation? You're willing to take on your, on your shoulders the responsibility 
of messing it up for the whole world, messing it up for me. Now it's a different story. Anyway, so this, this kind of ends this section of the Gemara where the Gemara discusses how far Tshuva reaches. And uh, tomorrow, we're going to get into the next part of the Gemara, which is going to talk more about um, like uh, how, how you know you've reached Tshuva properly and what are some of the hurdles a person meets, meets along the way and what are the things a person has to do to accomplish the proper Tshuva. That's going to be the next section of the Gemara, God willing. Have a wonderful day, everybody.